I'd like now to welcome John Gillow, who is an author, lecturer, traveler, and collector, and has spent more than 40 years collecting the folk textiles of Asia and Africa. Every year he collects and researches for several months of the year in many parts of the globe. John is also author of Indian textiles, traditional Indonesian textiles, arts and crafts of India, world textiles, African textiles, and printed and painted textiles of Africa. All these volumes have been published by Tem, Thames and Hudson and the British Museum. Textiles of the Islamic World is his latest book. There are copies of these books on the desk outside for those who would like to see them and order them after the lecture. May I call on you, John, now to please come and share all your knowledge with us, as much as you can in the, and the time given. <laughs> and then call and then uh, raise questions. Okay, Bye. thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you to Marion and everybody at the Brunei Gallery and at SOAS who've helped organize this lecture and the exhibition uh, down up upstairs, rather, um, which I do encourage you to go and look, particularly to look at the, the Cindy and the Kutchi textiles, which are just stunning. Anyway, I'm glad not all of you have gone to demonstrate against Donald Trump. It's, it's getting to be like 1968 again. I followed Tarek Ali into Grosvenor Square in October 68. He denied he ever led the march, but I was there. The police horses kicked and the helmets flew and it was all chaos. And I remember this bearded chap, bearded chap in a kind of Jeremy Corbyn type um, cap shouting at me, now you charge the police horses. And I thought, well, I'm the 16 year old schoolboy and you're the professional revolutionary, so why don't you charge the police horses? So this was my introduction to left wing politics. It was, that was probably Jeremy Corbyn himself, he was about the right age. Anyway, I digress as usual. Um, I've spent since 1974 going to the subcontinent and first came across uh, the wonderful embroidered textiles of Kutch and Saurashtra in Gujarat on Connaught Place. Went down there, collected stuff. Um, came back after my first long trip to India and uh, my sister noticed a advert in the Sunday Times magazine, which was for Joss Graham's first exhibition. So I went up there, and there we are. Joss and I were both very skinny in those days. It's difficult to believe, but we were. And there was Joss with his glasses held together with, um, not sellotape, um, with a luster plast. And on the wall were all these stunning things from Sindh. So I thought, hmm. Well, if Joss can do it, I can do it too. So I went off and collected more and started selling them to make my living. And Joss, I must thank for encouraging me later actually to go to Sint, um, because Sint was the very cornucopia of the wonderful textiles. So salam, Joss, and many thanks after all these years. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the people's of the lower Indus. Now what does this, let's see which way this works. Okay, is that one right? Left one. Okay, keyboards. Ah, yeah, now I know what I'm doing. Um, right, what I'm gonna do today is talk about um, the peoples of the Lower Indus, so basically about Sindh, the extreme south of Pakistani Punjab, 
and the adjoining, um, not so much, uh, the adjoining uh, province, let's say, of Kutch. Um, and these are the areas which have absolutely and utterly fabulous textiles. Pakistan is totally dependent on the waters of the Indus. Sindhu, it is called, um, and from that we derive the, uh, the, the word India and the word of, for the province of Sindh. Um, Sindh itself is desert towards India, the region of Tharpaka, and irrigated land, land irrigated from the Indus. The whole of Pakistan's economy is uh, mainly agricultural, and it is very much dependent on irrigation coming from the waters of the Indus. The Indus, of course, is temperamental. It flooded terribly in 2010, and many people were dispossessed, both right up in the north and uh, down in Sindh. The Indus is fed by the five rivers, um, which rise in the Hama the Indus itself rises in the Himalaya, and it, that with other four rivers, it constitutes the five rivers of the Punjab and also the Khyber River from uh, from Afghanistan feeds into it. My favourite part of uh, Sindh is is Tarpaka, which is a desert region, was up to 70 to 80 percent Hindu at the time of partition in 1947. It's less now, but it's still got very much a Hindu flavour. The villages there are divided up between a Muslim mahalla, a Muslim quarter, a caste Hindu quarter, a Megwa, who are a low caste, leather working um, people, and the tribals, the Beals. Um, they get along fine, but the way that they get along is still very much um, dictated by caste prejudice. Here's a little uh, bullock which has been decorated in the Hindu manner with um, hands dipped into henna. And here is everybody going off to the festival of um, uh, Chandapir. This is uh, in Tarpaka, near the village of Kantio, where my friends live. And we went there, and uh, not in this truck, I do assure you. We zigzagged across the desert in a, in a four-wheel drive. Uh, everybody comes, not a, although it's a Hindu temple, uh, not only Hindus, but, but Muslims, everybody comes. And there's a big kitchen, which is uh, manned by the caste Hindus, and they steer, stir great vats of rice and vegetable curry and suji sort of uh, sweets to give out to everybody, and everybody gets fed. And because they're caste Hindus, the high caste can eat as well as the low caste and the Muslims. These are jarts of the of desert. These are found both in um, Pakistan, in Sindh, and also in Kutch, in India. Um, the people there have a dowry tradition whereby the girls will learn to sew at an early age. Their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts, will all help them to sew a trousseau, and the trousseau is presented at the wedding on the basis, look, I'm good at embroidery, marry me. So it's a test so she can um, create all the clothes for the family. This is a wonderful um, blouse front, which is from Send, but I bought in Delhi in, in Connaught Place of a uh, a Wagri woman, a peddler caste woman um, from Gujarat. And it's the blouse front of a Lahana, um, Lahana people. The Lahanas are, are merchants. And it's, it's distinguished by, you can see uh, peacocks and baby peacocks on top of the mother peacock. This is a backless blouse worn by the 
by the Hindus, by the uh, Megwal, who are uh, low-caste leather workers. Again, it's floral, inset with shisha mirrors. The shishas are still being made in Shekhapur in the north of um, Sindh. I've got a commission from a Canadian friend of mine to go out and buy shisha mirrors for embroidery work um, to export to a friend of mine in Canada. Um, they no longer make shisha mirror in the traditional manner in India. All you get in India is, is sort of bits of um, glass which is just broken up your bathroom mirror. So the joy of Sindhi embroidery is both the flowers, the flowers that appear out of the desert when the monsoon rains come, the birds, the peacocks. Peacocks are symbols of uh, perfection and they also have the practical protective um, role of killing snakes. And mirrors, the mirrors are to perhaps to reflect the away, the evil eye, but I think it's more to imitate light on water. When the monsoon rains come and all the flowers burst up out of the desert, great pools of water appear and birds arrive, great big pelicans and all kinds of things. And it's the joy of rain and you're living in a very uh, dry, desiccated area. And the colour is to kind of counterbalance all that brown sand and uh, things that the, the landscape is basically quite dull. This is a wedding shawl that my ex used to wear the first time I ever saw her. I saw her at uh, Kent University in 1971. She was coming down the stairs wearing this as a, as a cape. Um, all long raven hair and bee stung lips and um, I kind of fell for her and when she left she left this behind but, <laughs> so I've still got it this is also Lahana from uh, from Sindh from a place called Diplo and there's a row at the bottom as you can see of uh, peacocks the Lohana are a Hindu merchant caste. They have a counterpart, the Memon, who are also merchants. And they're basically the same people. The Memon converted to Islam around about 200 years ago. And their embroidery is very similar. You can tell, distinguish between the two, is that the Lohana will put things like peacocks or animals in, and the all human figures. And the Memon will restrict themselves to geometric or floral patterns. This is the shisha I've got to go off and buy in a couple of months. Um, it's in the Mina Bazaar, in the uh, Women's Bazaar in Hyderabad, Sindh. Always remember when you're reading about the subcontinent, there are two Hyderabads. There's Hyderabad in Sindh and there's Hyderabad in Deccan, in, in southern India. So this shisha is sold by weight, uh, by the kilo, and the women who are going to embroider with shisha mirrors will take it home. They'll cut it up to the requisite size with a pair of scissors. Then they'll tack it down, and usually with buttonhole stitch, um, tie the mirror into the, to the embroidery. This is a chap in the same bazaar selling a typical uh, Cindy cap. Those are all the caps that are for sale. Sindh has got the reputation and still maintains it for having some of the best textiles in the subcontinent. It always had the best embroidery. It had fantastic weaving. It had uh, tie-dye, all kinds of techniques. But of course, as the years progress and the world changes and uh, technology spreads, it's the qualities going down. This is a wedding scarf of the Magwal. These are Hindus living in a predominantly Muslim environment, so they disguise their patterns. You've got to look carefully, and at the bottom of this slide, you can see there's a, a peacock with its beak, its crest, 
and its tail coming out, um, its tail to the side of it. But if you, if you just look, just glance at it, you think it's a flower. There are some very, very fine embroidery done by both the poorest of people and the richest of people. This is called a gudge um, and is a wedding garment of the Lahana who come from Thana Bula Khan. Thana Bula Khan, I've driven past, but I haven't been up. It's on, set on a, on, a, on a sort of mini mountain uh, by the side of the road between Karachi and, and uh, Hyderabad. Um, an old friend of mine said when he was very young, he used to go with his father-in-law buying these garments and they'd sell them to the Afghans who'd take them up to Kabul. These are all the, before all the dreadful wars that have afflicted Afghanistan. And he said he used to sling one over his shoulder and walk around the town. And gradually the women would come out and sell him these things. If he didn't put one on his shoulder, they wouldn't know what was going on and he wouldn't get anything. The first time I saw this work, I saw it in Kabul and uh, the Afghan merchants, I said, where's that from? And the Afghan merchants, of course, stroked their beards and held their hands up like that and said, it's from Afghanistan. But, you know, the world is full of uh, misinformation. This is the uh, quality of the embroidery. I should think this must take up to a year to embroider. Um, the girl will start it, but quite probably it's mother, grandmother, aunts who actually finish it. Um, the story the Lahana tell is that it's worn. Let's go back a bit if we can. Yeah. The Lahana say that it's worn that way on the day of the wedding, and the morning after, there's a kind of, it's reversed and there's a slit down here. Um, with two sachets of lavender either side of it. And if they wear it with the slit open like that, it says the wedding has gone okay and everything has gone okay. So there you are. It's a shawl from the Lahana. This is rather interesting. This is professional work. Um, most likely done by female professional embroiderers. It's done on probably silk imported from China and was done in Hyderabad. And this is a, a little dress for a little boy. And I suspect, though I'm not certain, that these were um, garments for circumcision ceremonies. You get very vivid tie-dye bandhani um, done in sin. This is a part of a Hindu woman's vast skirt. It's, it would be very long and would be very bulky around the waist. The tie-dye is not nearly as fine as the stuff you find in Kutch, but it, it's vivid. Um, I was complaining once when I was in Kutch at a place called Mandwi on the coast about the quality of the tie and dye that you find in Pakistan. I said, the stuff they sell in Karachi is rubbishy. And the chap that I bought very good tie and dye from, he, he said, yes, it's made by my brother. <laughs> <laughs> this is a rather wonderful um, shawl that I actually left on a train going from London to Cambridge, and it's one of my great regrets. And of course, today being today, I never got the bag back in which it was in. Um, and these are, there are two stories of where these are made. One is that they were made um, in Tarpaka by, by Hindus. I think almost certainly they're, they're Hindu practitioners. And the other one is that they came from, from Punjab, from a place called Bahal Naga which is on the border of Pakistan adjoining Bikanir. But what I love, again, is the, the peacocks in the corner. And at the bottom, that's probably a scorpion. 
scorpions were um, protective. They were to uh, ward off the smallpox goddess and also to protect the children. This is a technique called Rogan. Um, the Rajputs of the desert in Sindh wear this kind of work. Um, I've seen them at that festival that I, I started off with. Um, the people are coming right out of the deep desert and they've never seen a white man before and their eyes are like that, just open wide. It was, it was utterly wonderful. I was talking to a relative of my friends who was a quite a senior civil servant in Karachi and he said when he was young, um, oh, well, not so long ago, before they introduced electricity, the whole thing was just oil lamps and camels. It must have been wonderful. These cloths are decorated with a technique called rogan. Rogan means um, oil. When you go to your local Bangladeshi or Pakistani takeaway and you order rogan gosht, what you're ordering is oily meat, um, which is what you get. Um, so rogan is, a, is castor oil, which is brewed up till it forms a consistency of putty and you add pigment to it, and then you, you paint it onto the textile. What you mustn't do, which I once did foolishly, is try to iron these things, because it um, creates a complete mess. These are still done in Kutch, in a place called Nirona, which is west of the capital of Kutch, Buj. And I think these were exported from Kutch to Sint uh, till very recently. The border up till 10 years ago was very porous and things used to get smuggled across. There used to be a system whereby, as there are families on either side and they're all invited for, for weddings and uh, other festive and other family gatherings, there used to be a system whereby they'd take, if you were coming from India, they'd take you to near the border and then you'd take, if you were a Hindu, they'd take off all your Hindu clothes, uh, take away your money, um, your identity card, the whole thing. They'd give you Pakistani clothes, Salwa Kameez. They'd give you a bus ticket from whatever, the, the village they're going to, to Karachi. They'd give you some uh, Pakistani rupees, and then they'd set you across the border. Because people see, speak the same language either side of the border. So it's not that difficult to, um, to disappear into the mass of the crowds. And then they'd meet their relatives, attend the wedding, and then they'd come back. It used to be there, there, all, there was all kinds of interaction. I remember an old army officer telling me that um, from the mess in Lahore, the capital of the Punjab, um, the regiments used, the officers of the regiments used to go and drink at a place called Ferozpur, which is in, in India. But it's because of partition. Ferozpur was left sort of out on a limb. It's much easier to reach it from Pakistan than it is from the rest of India. So these Pakistani officers used to get invited every other month to get drunk in the, um, in the mess of their... Uh, regiments in, in, in Ferozpur and then they used to respond and return the hospitality and the Indians used to go to, to Lahore. Maybe these things still happen now but maybe not. This is a Baluch woman in the uh, bazaar, in, in, the, in the women's bazaar in, in Hyderabad. The Baluch are found all over um, southern Pakistan. They are found, of course, in Baluchistan. They're found in eastern Iran. They're found up into Afghanistan. But they're found in Sindh and southern Pakistani Punjab. The Baluch were actually colonized in the 1500s, colonized a lot of Sindh and southern Pakistani Punjab. And their social mores actually dictate a lot of what goes on a lot of the social structure in Pakistan. You can tell a Baluch, I mean, I tell them because they've always got really sharp noses, as you can note with this woman here, 
and her daughter behind her. But um, a better test is she'll all be, always be wearing a pashk, which is the loose smock that the Baluchi wear. And it'll have an embroidered blouse, embroidered cuffs, and a, kang a pentagonal kangaroo uh, pocket uh, just at crutch level. This is part of an animal trapping, also Baluch, uh, but done on, done with, with small carry shells, mirrors, and it's done on old English broadcloth. The British, or the English rather, exported um, broadcloth, which was made in Gloucestershire, in Painswick, to, uh, or Nailsworth, Nailsworth, um, all over the world, and people bought it for curiosity often, but they liked it because it, you could cut it and you didn't have to hem it. This is a animal trapping, probably for a, a camel, but I've had one of these from the 19th century, which is cowrie shells, and the red cloth is actually old red coat uniform. So it's old British Army uniform, or British Indian Army uniform. And you, you don't often find, everybody assumes that the, the red cloth is always old army uniform, but you ra rarely actually find it. This rather wonderful shawl is from the mayor of, um, who are a pastoral, very rich pastoral uh, people from the extreme north of Sindh around Sukra and then up into, um, into Pakistani Punjab. So they're both sides of the, of the prejudicial uh, border. Um, so they are probably, to my mind, the best embroiderers in the whole of the subcontinent. If you look at the exhibition, there is a display of their um, cushion covers um, or mats with incredibly fine work. Um, they're so fine and so regular, again, I wonder whether there's a professional aspect to their creation. Sindh is the land of quilts. This is at the uh, festival of um, Chandapir. And this chap who really didn't want his photograph taken, like uh, most people don't want their photograph taken, is sheltering from the midday sun underneath a patchwork quilt. This is across the border in Kutch, and this is a Matvar woman, one of the um, Muslim herding castes, and she's exhibiting a wonderful um, quilt ap with applique details that, that she's made. This is a typical patchwork quilt uh, from Thapakar. Um, this is made by the Chahan people who are laborers. They, if you ask these people how long they've been doing these quilts, they will say, from the very dawn of time we've been doing it, or at least since the Emperor Akbar, in fact, these are most likely the influence of uh, Protestant American missionaries in the late 19th century. There's a magazine called the Female Missionary Intelligentsia, which a Singaporean scholar has recommended to me, but I've never actually, to my shame, read. But she said that one of the um, things this magazine, this is a 19th century magazine, um, did was lay out what you could teach um, to the people you were trying to convert. And the people who make these quilts are usually low caste, so they would have been the target for Christian missionaries. This is a rather beautiful Cindy quilt with, with patchwork and reverse applique. A group of women will work together to make a quilt and they'll be made for weddings. They're not only to cover uh, people to keep out the desert cold, 
um, but they'll be used as floor spreads. I remember once going to a performance in the interior of Sivd, and you, of course, had to take your shoes off to go into the house, but all the mud floor was covered in quilts. This is a Rajput woman, so Hindu woman, um, in the village of Kantia, making a quilt for the market. Um, my suppliers, my Hindu supplier in, in Karachi says, we can't get any more quilts. And uh, however much we were paying, they were paying them about the equivalent of about 20 pounds to, to make these quilts, which is an appreciable amount of money for the local economy. But what has happened was when the security situation between India and Pakistan calmed down and the Pakistanis were reassured that the Indians were never going to invade again. Uh, Mush, General Musharraf, who was uh, president of Pakistan at the time, built power lines out to the desert. So I stayed in a place which had air conditioning, for heaven's sake. And with electricity comes, of course, television. And what are the women doing now? They're not embroidering. They're not making quilts. They are sitting there with their mouths open, watching Mexican soap operas translated into Urdu or Sindhi. So the enemy of traditional textiles is TV. What the smartphone will do to the creation of um, traditional textiles, I don't know. This is a very interesting itinerant group called the Sami, and the Sami are beggars by profession. They do seasonal agricultural work. The men wander as far as Iran to beg. Um, they have Muslim names, but whether they're in fact Hakka Muslims is, is open to doubt. Um, they live, this was outside the old Mughal town of Tata um, by the Indus. And they live on raised wooden platforms made out of bent sticks. And they have an awning over the, um, this platform. And the platforms are quite high, quite wide. And at night, the women all sleep on one and the men all sleep on another. They make wonderful quilts like this. Um, one of their part-time jobs is as rag pickers. So they'll unpick salwa kameez. Um, so it's not necessarily pure cotton. It'll be, have a admixture of synthetic but the colors are pretty wonderful. And then these women who have got absolutely no uh, concept of art produce these things that are rival abstract art. When I sell these things, I said, see, that's like a $50,000 painting. Just buy it. You know, occasionally they do. <laughs> this is one I bought in the 80s. The quilted, they've usually got a, uh, a backing quite often, a, a block print, and they'll take, they're quilted going around the edges and working um, in concentric rectangles onto the inside. So sometimes it goes a bit wonky on the inside. And they'll embroider with at least three needles and they'll push the fabric back onto those needles. So they'll do lines of say, three of white with white thread, and then they'll change the color of the threads, three with pink thread, three with green thread, three with blue thread. So they'll vary the stitches. And because they're varying the color of the stitches, that gives a variation to the color of the, of the quilt. This is a quilt made by the Megwa, who are low caste, for the Das or Pali Muslim landowning caste, for the, the Jamandas. 
because um, Sindh is very, you can call it feudal, but the peop some people are very rich and some people are very poor, and the people who are very rich call the shots. Families like the Butos, they're old landowners from, from the north of the Sindh. They have an immense amount of local and provincial power, and sometimes Pakistan-wide power. The Megwell will quilt these using a stitch called Kambiri stitch, which is um, make, made up of steps to form a, a diamond shape. And this one is then this one is then decorated with little flecks uh, of felt, give it like a sort of sweeties or smarty effect. These are there are lots of bags made like this, there are lots of squares made like this, but very few quilts. I've just got another one. I, I always like to have a, um, a good one. My Rosie hid this, on this particular quilt under her bed for three years, denying that she knew where it was, it's just so I wouldn't sell it. And then, of course, I sold it. This is the another quilt that they've used an embroidered shawl as the face of the quilt. This is a pretty typical Sami quilt um, from, from Sint, um, made on a, with a Ajrak block print. The Sami are quite savvy. When Rosie and I went to see them, I, I shouted a very loud salam alaikum. So they called the dogs off because they're very fierce dogs. Uh, Rosie talked to the women, I talked to the men. The men were friendly and showed me their dogs, showed me what they ate, which was um, they had tethered, tethered terrapins and tethered um, porcupines. Um, when they this didn't happen to me, but this is the story that's always told about the Sami. When you come to visit them, they'll lay out a quilt, you know, a very classy quilt, and you'll sit on it. And when they get bored with you, and when they feel it's time for you to go, they'll just turn the corner of the quilt over, and it's time to disappear. This is a... Um, Chowdhury, so he's a village leader. Um, this is in the town of Matiari in Sindh, uh, near Hyderabad. And here they're block printing Ajrak. Um, it used to be when I first went to Sindh and you went into the interior, every man wore one of these cloths. Um, there are certain designs for the Muslims, and there's a certain design called a malir, which is reserved for the Hindus. But now, if they wear it at all, it's usually screen printed or mill made, or heaven help us, imported from China. And the handmade stuff is only really given to as, as gifts. It's the kind of thing if you've got a political meeting and you want to give. Um, you want to honor somebody, you commission a ajrak and then you give it to them. Here they're making ajrak. This is the uh, in Matiari. And uh, unlike in India where they block print with high tape, standing with high tables, they're still doing it in the traditional manner, which is sitting cross-legged on the floor and block printing at a low table. There's the, the mud floor and, and the cockerel, which is sort of wandering around. Whenever you're making, whenever you're printing, you need lots of water to wash out the dyes. And the, they always say that the quality of the mineral quality of the water um, affects the colors um, that you make. My friends in, um, in Kutch, Ismail Baikatri and his brothers. The two brothers have stayed in um, Damadka, which is their original home. 
where the river has dried up and the water has dried up, so they've got terrible problems with that. And Ismail Bai, who was the most, is the most enter enterprising of the brothers, he moved to near Buj, the capital of Kutch, um, put in some boreholes, and there's plenty of water there. But the water isn't quite right. There are still sort of problems with the, how it affects the dyes. So this chap is in Matiari, and his job is to wash out, to rinse all the um, azure cloth. A hundred years ago, uh, even 80 years ago, even 60 years ago, they were still weaving incredibly fine silk brocades. This is uh, known as a longi. It's woven at a place called Nasapur, and some of them were woven at Tata. And they're turbans, very fine turbans. And they were sold to the Maldaris, who were the, ca the cattle traders, who could be either Muslim or Hindu. And you'll find these also on the, on the Indian side. This is a Kaz from Send. This is a double weave. Um, it's it, I feel they're an imitation of, of British double weaves that were um, used by the, uh, by the British colonials. Um, and this is, uh, again, woven at Nasapur. All the camels have wonderful camel girths that are made out of goat hair. Uh, they're made by a technique called split, pl split ply. If you're interested in the technique, buy the late, great Peter Collingwood's book on split ply camel girls. Here's um, the late Bishwar Singh of Jaisalmer making a camel girth. Briefly, you put f about 40 strands of goat hair on a little wooden stick, uh, you take the first cord and then feed it diagonally but with, the, with, a, with a wooden needle, feed it through to the opposite selvage and then down again. And because the cords are four ply, two black and two white, you can change it by twisting it so the white appears on one surface and the black on the reverse. So you can get a pattern of, say, a white camel on a black background, and on the other side, it'll be a black camel on a white background. I was with my friend Nick Barnard when we were researching our book, Traditional Indian Textiles, and Ishwash Singh was showing us everything, and we were asking loads of questions, and he was getting bored. And I could see him thinking, when are these ridiculous white guys going to actually buy something? And then I saw a detail on the camel girth he was making, which was of acrobats, sort of one on top of two men, on top of three men, on top of four men. And I knew this didn't occur in western Rajasthan, where Jason was, it occurs in uh, eastern Rajasthan. So I said, where's that from? And he said, Eastern Rajasthan. Then he had another, there was another pattern, which was just a black diamond with two black triangles at either end on a white ground. And I said, what's that pattern there? And he looked at me and he went, chocolates, Cadbury's chocolate eclairs. And we both burst out laughing. And then we were friends and I bought a couple of his, uh, split ply belts for as presents for my sons and yeah we got them fine this is the uh, split ply pattern so you've got hunters with guns and these are ladies in a charabank like an old-fashioned lorry on its way to a wedding those are the hunters now we move across the border from Sindh, uh, from Nagapaka into Kutch. Kutch is centered around the Ran of Kutch, which you've probably heard of, which is a salt flats, basically. 
return. It's the old dried up bed of the Indus River. There was a great earthquake in the very early years of the 19th century, some, somewhere about 1810. I can't recall precisely the date. And that changed the course of the Indus. So the Indus flows out to the sea further west in Pakistan, I think from Tata going south. And that dried up bed of the Indus is salt flats for most of the year. But when the rains come, it floods and you get this incredible pasturage and semi-nomadic pastoralists from all over come and graze their flocks. You can see the men traveling. The men always travel with their herding sticks over their shoulders like that, with their arms draped like that. And the, it's not the oldest man who guides the migration. It's the most active, mature male. The old guys are there for advice about what to do. But there's a captain, and he determines everything. The women bring up the rear with the camels, the beds, the small children, and they move. So they'll have a home village in Kutch, and then they'll migrate to the pasturage with their flocks of sheep and goats and camels. We're now in predominantly Hindu area. So here we have a roadside god, the sort of the building blocks of Hinduism is the, you know, the, the roadside shrines are one of the important things. These are the Jak shrines. This is a part of uh, Rajput mythology. So this is a, 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 a shrine in Kutch. This is what a Kutchy home looks like. These people uh, are the Aya, spelled A-H-I-R. And these are herders. Um, and they're, they're cattle people. And you can see an embroidered Toran to decorate over the doorway to the main room of the house, and then all the pots and pans and chest also decorated with mirrors behind. That's the interior of another Aya house. And here you have the Rabari. Um, uh, the shepherdesses uh, with their tie-dyed woolen shawls. This is a Rabari young, young man walking through the streets of Anjar. It's market day. These are Rabari waiting for a bus. There's a young Rabari girl with her father and uncle father wearing this wonderful little jacket. Um, you, these, are, these jackets are imported here and sold to women, but actually they're for men. They have long sleeves and they have a, a, fl uh, a skirt that flares from the waistline. And it's basically to keep them cool during the day. And the sleeves are very long and those are pulled down um, at night to keep their hands warm. This is a... Uh, coverlet for a, a, a baby basket. When the Rabari are on their migration, they carry their babies in a kind of log basket with a cover like this over it. When I was in Anjar once, I got a, um, a sailor offered to translate for me, and I went up to a Rabari grandmother and mother um, in a little haberdashery shop where they were buying mirrors to, for embroidery. And they had one of these baskets with the most beautiful embroidered covered covers. So I, I sort of pointed and sort of, you know, what, what's underneath there? And they looked rather dubiously, dubiously at me. But um, the sailor said, well, ah, he's all right. So they pulled the cover up, and there was the babe, powder sugar, powder rice, just, just like wandering around Sainsbury's. They make covers for their uh, domestic animals. This is for the bullocks. These are can be people farming, set, settle farming people. And these are the Rabari um, who are all dressed up to celebrate Gokul Astame, which is Krishna's birthday. They got off this truck. Um, they shouted at me 
and my taxi driver translate it for me. And you know, they're, they're the kind of people you know, who live outside, so they shout automatically. Um, so I thought they were being very hostile, but actually what they were saying is, make sure you get a picture of the truck in, in, as well as us, because my, my friend owns the truck. So there they are, wearing these wonderful turbans, these wonderful embroidered long jackets. They're wearing leather curl tip shoes shod with metal. And what was great about it is that each of these Rabari, and there were about 20 of them, had matching tartan nylon socks. <laughs> with some enterprising Hindu shopkeeper had said, right, that'll go great with your outfit. And I'll finish up, um, as I'm sure I've gone over time. Um, this is a Rabari shepherd boy in the market at Anjar with his little sister. He's looking suspicious and she's looking a little frightened. But it's a wonderful area. So you can go to Kutch, no problem at all. Um, Pakistan has its moments, but is one of my very favorite countries. It's uh, full of very hospitable and very kind people. Um, it's a bit difficult to get a visa for various reasons, but do persevere. It's, it's a fantastic area. Still is, despite all the advances of the 21st century. Anyway, thank you very much indeed. If you've got any questions far away, um, I've got a very few copies of my books outside which are for sale. And if you want to order them online, you can just take the uh, title and the ISBN and order it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any questions, they, um, it, it, I'm sure John will be delighted to answer them. So I'm going to leave you in his very capable hands to, uh, to ask any, uh, anything you'd like to know more. They're on plus. They want to rush off and demonstrate against Donald Trump, I know. No, no. There's tea and coffee. They're all of the right generation. You know, you can wave some banners uh, and, and he'll reform, I'm sure. And after the questions, if you'd like to know more about um, anything that is particularly um, important for you, there's tea and coffee and you can continue the conversation with him. But um, let me thank you, John, for Not at absolutely all. delightful. It's my pleasure. I, I, like, I like blathering. The, 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 the recollections of sin were marvelous. <laughs> Far away, can you? Thank you. That lady is, you've got to be a gentleman, you've got to be a gentleman, George. Thank you. Um, that was fantastic. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the actual stitches that are used. I could see that there was running stitch and you talked about buttonhole stitch, but are there any other there's, stitches that are typical? There's a lot of chain stitch and although um, I've built myself as, on, as an expert on embroidery and have been collecting it and dealing with it for nigh on 50 years. I'm a complete ignoramus as to the stitches. What I should recommend is get hold of any of the many books by Anne Morell and she will uh, tell you what stitches they use. Um, the Calico Museum in um, Ahmedabad in Gujarat uh, produces a lot of them. But if you just Google and Morel, you'll get all her publications. The one, um, her first one, um, which I think was called something like Indian Embroidery, she did that under her maiden name, Anne Butler. So I apologize, I ought to know, but I don't. Thank you. Joss? Oh, uh, uh, my question, John, um, is to do with the item that is called the Bunchki. 
which is yeah. the envelope bag that you find. Yeah. Can you say something about how these are used by all Butch people? key as far as I can make out, and again, this is like, like, like your information, it comes from dealers and you've got to kind of you know, sift it out and whatever, but it seems to be that they're vanity bags and the story that I've heard many times repeated is these, these are beautiful envelope shaped bags, often with exquisite embroidery on the basis that it, it's small and they can do very fine stitchery on it. Um, they're vanity bags which are made by the sister or the female cousin of the bride and given to the, bri given to the bride for the wedding. And then she'll keep, basically, the, the vanity bags, she'll keep needles and thread, anything, makeup, muck up. They're always telling me, bring some muck up. Have you got something to add? Uh, thank you very much. It was really delightful uh, to hear you. I just wanted to two things. One is I'm very curious as to how in Sindh this developed to this, this, this type of art form. And the second that I also noticed that similarity between Sindh, Kutch, as well as in uh, Andhra, they make similar things. Yeah. Uh, so can you just elaborate on the well, connection there? Well, let's say that the, it's a guess, but I feel the embroidery, and, and Joss might disagree, or he might confirm what I got as my, my guess, but I guess the embroidery tradition has come from the West with the nomadic peoples who came into that part of, of the Indian subcontinent. Um, not necessarily Muslim, I think it predates it predates the Muslims. And um, the, the other thing is this, the suspicion is that embroidery originated in China. So how that sort of, how the technique, how the craft of embroidery arrived on the subcontinent, I don't know. But if you look at the embroidery tradition done for weddings. You know, it stretches from Morocco right away across North Africa. It stretches from the Balkans, Eastern Europe, down to Istanbul, Constantinople, across Turkey, up into um, Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And then it more or less comes to a halt in Sindh, Kutch, Saurashtra, and Western Rajasthan. And you say that these stitches are found in Andhra, but it, that's the Banjara, and the Banjara are wandering peoples. And again, I suspect they brought those traditions from the West. And the mirrors were, which we think as intrinsic to Indo-Pakistani embroidery. Um, were, to my mind, influenced by the Persian tradition of mirror work palaces. But the actual mirrors themselves were European. They were exported as ballast and on, in the European trading ships. So the, the French, the English, the Dutch, I don't know about the Portuguese, exported the waste mirrored glass from European manufacturer, uh, manufacturers, and that was sold in India. Um, presumably then uh, they started embellishing their clothes with those mirrors. And then you got local manufacturer um, near Ahmedabad in Gujarat and in the north of Sindh. Thank you. I, I was just going to add to that, John, to say that I understand that there are sort of two, ma two main passages for this immigration from the West. One yeah. is down through Central Asia, through the north of Pakistan, around the Khyber Pass. Yeah. And that is the one that leads into Kangra and the northern territories. Of yeah, India. sure. 
And then there is another migration which comes along the Makran corridor, yeah. which is the uh, above the Arabian nation. And um, there are certain stitches that, such as uh, Shireen Froznana wrote about in her little pamphlet on Sindhi embroidery about interlacing stitch, how that it was in the Sindh it's called Kachi, in Sindh it's called Baluchi stitch, but it's actually, you can trace it back to the south of Iran and then eventually to, to Europe. Th to Switzerland, to 40, yeah. 14th century Switzerland, and it's a stitch that traveled from west to east rather than east to west. But there are other traditions that travel in the other direction, such as with the Roma gypsies and so on. Such as what, sorry, Josh? With the Roma gypsies who split yeah, off yeah. from India owing to the Muslim persecution in the sort of 1000 AD. So it's a complex picture. Yeah. But Put, easy to put together relatively. I think also if, you, if we're talking about transmission of pattern and technique, always remember that women up to very recently, up to a generation ago, were creating these wonderful textiles, partly for their beauty, partly for social reasons, but partly for entertainment. They get up very early, they get the men off to the fields or off to the flocks. Um, they'll have fed them, they've got to send out lunch to them. And then the very hot hours of the day, they've got nothing else to do. So they'll, they'll have swept the house and deep. The houses are quite bare, there's not much furniture. They'll get all the housework done. And then they like to sit around with their female mates and embroider. So it, it's, it was a lot of it was entertainment like Re relaxation sorry relaxation yeah and this is this has now been replaced by gawping at um, Mexican soap operas but <laughs> what can you do hi um, fantastic talk and it's good to no, uh, hear positive things about Pakistan. Uh, just clarifications. Um, uh, uh, what's the the d d division of labor between males and females regard with regards to, let's say, rally embroidery? Uh, you know, the quilt, the rally, and the um, I don't know because I left the room for a few minutes. I perhaps you touched upon that because there is this um, whole concept of putting a nazar battu right in the middle of the the quilt, uh, uh, you know, formation quilt, quilted embroidery, and the colors, for example, that are chosen, uh, from what I've heard, that they are chosen by the males and then uh, the male population who are actually into embroidery and embroidered by females. So is there some kind a, of a gender, um, you know, division of labor over there? That's just one. The other aspect is when you talked about uh, the uh, the cryptic ac aspect of, uh, let's say, uh, the, the Hindus basically trying yeah. to... Um, Disguise you know, that. Absolutely. So is this something to do with persecution or is there some kind of political, uh, uh, more sort of... My, minorities, in, minorities in Muslim countries have all, always got to be careful about uh, display of their um, religious symbols and um, Hindus like to... Uh, incorporate human and animal figures and the gods in their, in their art. And this is disapproved of by Sunni Islam. But as you've got to remember is that uh, uh, the world of Islam is full of different uh, people of different persuasions. The Shia, um, of whom there are many in Pakistan, uh, are much more tolerant of, of the image of, of people, animals. The other, the division of labor between the sexes is the women do nearly all the embroidery. Um, the men do the tie dye and the block printing. So the, I'm just trying to think whether there's, yeah, there's a tradition in places like Lahore of uh, metal thread embroidery um, and that would be men because it's high value it's sold for a high price and there's enough money 
to pay the man's wages. Remember, the man is, even today, almost always the breadwinner and the women are at home and they're homemakers. And the embroidery, if it's amateur, done for love, done for social occasions, will be done by women. But anything, any craft whereby there's a, a commercial sale at the end of it is almost always men. I hope that answers your question. Again, sorry? Well, the, uh, the Sami quilts you're talking about, the, the abstract ones. Oh, the applique ones. The applique ones are the, um, the term, at least in Gujarat, for the applique is the ancient Sanskrit phrase, cut up, which is, of course, from the English, cut up. <laughs> and so, like, you, you assume these, a lot of these techniques are ancient. Actually, it's colonial, often missionary influence. And so the, um, the applique and the reverse applique would be an introduction from the West. Thank you very much. Not at all. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating talk, first of all. Um, my question was about um, the base materials themselves. Embroidery presupposes a medium on which you embroider. And much of what you showed looked like cotton. There were some added, the, the little polka dot decoration came from felt. And when one considers the range, diurnal and also climatic, um, there's a seasonal change in temperatures and um, climatic conditions just within a single year. Um, that suggests that um, very different um, materials might be used, particularly among nomadic peoples who would use much heavier materials than those living in a warm area. So my question was about the base material and about the, you mentioned metallic threads, but would the threads be silk, be cotton, just what they had? Would, they, would the base materials be bought? You mentioned some rag gatherers, but for, for those who are not rag gatherers, where do the base materials come from? The quilts will be they? made out of... Um, store-bought cloth which is dyed to order with um, very inferior chemical dyes so don't drink your glass of white wine on top of your quilt because it will run. That's one thing. Most of all the materials are cotton because it's generally very hot. You can see in the last slides I showed the Rabari women were wearing a tie-dyed woolen shawl. So as you correctly say even within a a very hot day, you can get a cool night, and in winter it gets incredibly cold. So they wrap themselves up, the Rabari women, in woolen shawls. The men will have woolen blankets, um, which are woven on local pit looms. So they, they, they dress for the, um, uh, for the climate. And the cloth is either hand-woven cotton, uh, mill-woven cotton. They'll use silk or they'll use um, hand-woven wool. Hope that answers your question. The embroidery threads are bought. Uh, were they silk or cotton? Um, Both. Yeah. And the... Um, Pakistan always had a more open economy than um, India. So you can tell one of the blouse fronts I showed you by the Megwal with all the uh, pom-poms and um, birds and flowers and mirrors. That's from scent, but you get exactly the same embroidery done across the border in Kutch. And you can tell the difference because the ones in Sindh in Pakistan, they use silk thread and the ones in India they use cotton thread because they can't get imported silks.
in case, shall we call it a day and move? Thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. And And not going to Trafalgar Square. Thank you so much for coming to hear John. As you can see, it was well worth it. Uh, and for those of you who might still want to pick on all his information, there's tea and coffee being served with biscuits to send you, uh, and we can all go ahead and have something to drink before leaving and being able to actually meet John in person. So, John, I'll take this opportunity of thanking you and School of Oriental and African Studies for giving me this opportunity of having you all here. Thank you so much. For My coming. pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>